Hello? Good morning. Good morning. All right. Uh, when do we get started? So, welcome to our Saturday meeting. If you're here for GSOC, thank you for showing up. Uh, we'll also have this session recorded so people can consult it later. We'll talk a little bit about GSOC coming up uh, in the meeting, but um, you know, it, this is our main meeting that we do. It, it's kind of a it's called Saturday morning neurosim, but it covers a lot of the stuff we're doing in the lab in totality. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff about neuroscience and simulation and other things, but it kind of goes broader than that a lot of the times. But um, but that's okay. That's that's kind of what we do. In the lab, so I, I, um, I would like to start maybe with updates if you have any, and then we can get into some things. So I, I don't know, Jod, welcome. Uh, did you want to introduce yourself? Uh, hello, I'm Ajad. I'm actually a undergraduate student in India. Nice to meet all. Nice to meet. You. Yeah, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, so we'll yeah, we'll talk a little bit about some of the GSOC stuff a little bit later. So um any other updates? I'm just getting some coffee now, so right. give me give me a couple more minutes to gather my thoughts. All right, no problem. So um, I have, I'll mention a few things, and I don't know if we'll go in, in depth with them later on, uh, but it depends on kind of the flow of the meeting and the time for it. But um, some some uh, bullet points are, uh, <laughs> I'll put this out a little bit. Um, with some humor. Congratulations to uh, myself, Bradley, Morgan, and Amanda for finally finishing the biology clinician paper oh, yeah. uh, by Macharana from 1970. Um, I think it's a really interesting ride, and, and I think everybody has a lot of different uh, like impressions and takes and, and senses about it, but it, like that was, that was something from Mission Futures uh, and and the cyber next reading group. First time we ever really did a kind of crossover of the two groups, which is fun. Like I mean, there's a lot of crossover anyway, but it it was sort of fun. To, it was a very interesting experience. I guess I put it that way. Um, so that was sort of a, a a very a paper from a very specific time that led to or does some ties to like what would become of cybernetics and what was sort of before something before a lot of the something that, that that was written before a lot of what we kind of talk about now really existed in the way that it does now. Um but, but that was interesting and 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 kind of looking forward to what's next beyond that too in, in those spaces. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's that was sort of a Silly tongue in cheek um, update, but 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 also like I think there's some things that will come from that that are that are nice. Um, outside of that, other updates include. Um, I don't have anything yet, but there's been a lot of work on um, the. Uh, Not just, I mean, in terms of almost like in more of an administrative sense, the DSM project, uh, and and sort of how to do some things with that. Um, in relation to that, or, or more broadly, uh, I think I think I know I didn't really talk about this with Bradley yet, but uh, sort of re restoking the internship fire, I guess, 
was there's something I've been thinking about quite a bit in terms of both uh, like directly for for the lab in terms of maybe social media or like a lab manager, assistant lab manager type stuff. And then also specifically for some of the projects that are upcoming, or I guess ongoing too. Um, I looked I looked at some of the ones we had a, we had a large pool of like previous internship postings. Um, and I also unintentionally came across the, the ones I put on, like I advertised them on LinkedIn. I actually got, got a lot of responses to both of the ones that we put on LinkedIn. Um, I just like very, even for very obviously stating that they were, you know, unpaid internships that were designed to provide experience and, and give us unique things that we can do. Um, they, they, I kind of forgot, like, oh, we've got really over a really good amount of uh, responses to both of them. So that, that's, there's some things moving that forward that way. And I think that's sort of a, hey, let's like have a lot of discussion about that soon territory. Um, and there's some things for the DSM project and, and other things too um, that are on my mind specifically about that. Uh, beyond that, um, a, a, color, a few other smaller or like um, other bullet points would be, uh, I believe I have applied to, well, I know I that I have applied <laughs> to the uh, Embodied Intelligence uh, Conference. Um, I'm going to talk something about uh, terminology related. The title was something along the lines of, like, like you know, um, embodied or and or like diverse intelligence and and, and uh, terms or, or like you know, language. How how we, how we talk about it? Something along those lines. I forget the uh, Also, the, I believe is about. I think Hussein did as well. I kind of I, yeah. you talked a bit about it. And um, I, I, um, I, I believe they were doing something on, you know, uh, VR related. Uh, so that was cool. I think it'd be a, a nice, a nice experience for the lab to do all those things. Um, I didn't submit anything for like embodied neurophenomenology, um, but I could try to maybe sneak that in today if that's something we wanted to. Um, but I didn't. I didn't intentionally do that yet, or did not, I didn't make that happen yet. Yeah. Um, but also thanks um, uh, for, I did, I did also uh, submit to the Dizzy uh, Diversity Challenges uh, um, Summer Institute, which is a really amazing group, and that should be fun. There's a few summer schools that have popped up. Um, I'm going to also uh, Neuromatch, speaking of that, um, is opening their applications. They have four, it looks like, courses, including a new Neuro AI one, which is allegedly the most advanced one yet, uh, or at least it was sort of a suggestion that you've done one or two first, uh, or, or done one of like computational neuroscience or whatever. Um, or, or, and, or, I forget if it's both, or like, or the deep learning one. But um, that looks interesting. And but yeah, a lot of, I had, I had a, a, a general Joe Pro meeting this week as well, um, where a lot of administrative things were sorted out. Um, I've talked a bit about different projects. I've talked about like sort of, um, you know, I mentioned things like person studies and sort of like the sort of writing manifestos for this or that. And there's quite a bit more, uh, there's some reorganizing and some some thinking about what to do. And I feel, I feel very uh, good about where we are with that now. And um, things, things to come out of that ahead, but basically the quick takeaway is I think I kind of demarcated what some projects or working groups will be or will look like and some of the relationship administratively to that that I want to do through Joe Pro, but also um, 
again, returning to sort of the mentoring aspects too. And, and there's, there's been some talk uh, as it came with out for both with Joe Crow and both with Orel, but uh, potentially there's someone interested in um, like helping out with sort of the onboarding process, like sort of the training, some of the getting people up to up to pace and looking at sort of our materials in that process, uh, which I think would be a big help for both. Uh, but but also like it really it seemed like it would be a very relevant thing for much of the summer events that are coming our way. Um, so more about that too. And um i guess the only other like quick things to mention would be a, a really interesting looking event the in the girl press uh event um which i i guess is like an event like it's almost like a three-day two-day two to three-day conference with a bunch of people talking from a different bunch of different viewpoints from Evan Thompson and Mike Levin to other people uh i might actually try to go to that virtually um because it, it seems interesting and other brief bullet points would be the length that morgan talked about for the technological approach to mind everywhere by levin is really good i i, I didn't i'm sure he's talked about it before but it was a 12 minute video from the semf group or his talk at one of the SCMF events. And it led me to learn a little bit more about that. The, the TAME framework by Levin, but also SEMF2, which is quite interesting. I didn't really understand what they were doing with who they are. Um, but, but it's something about, I think Morgan might know better than me, but it's sort of a, like, uh, they're, so like foundational research that's interdisciplinary. I forget how to say it. Yeah, I, I, I don't actually know their backstory, but they seem, or the speaker set reminds me a lot of like a Foresight Institute, if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, what group is this though? SEMF. Yeah, I'll look it up. One sec. Yeah, it's. It's uh here. I'll put the link in the chat. But um they you're very interested in, in sort of interdisciplinary um our goal is to foster rigorous intellectual inquiry and transdisciplinary research. Uh and, and doing that in a society for multidisciplinary and fundamental research. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Didn't like that. Um, <laughs> seem to be yeah. based in Spain. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know. Well, no, I'm looking at their. Uh, oh, we're all looking at the timeline. Page. Yeah. So they have the timeline from being an online platform during COVID to. Uh, transitioning to an interdisciplinary school to operations. COVID, yeah. COVID had a few a few silver linings. Yeah, well, yeah. But you know. <laughs> which is an interesting way to talk about again about mirror match, uh, which kind of all in, in that space. Uh, yeah. So my, my my update this week is about mirror match. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um I think Oh, only other thing I'll mention really briefly is um, not what I wanted to say. Sorry, I went to just pull up this title because I can't figure out what the title of this book is. I found a really amazing book. Um, actually, it was a uh, just share my screen for this. I don't know if I'll talk much about it, but just to mention it here, um, this book. Um, is really appealing so far. I've only read the first little bit of it, um, but it's it was recommended from an open courseware. It was a it was a syllabus material from open courseware uh, from MIT about like history 
in her philosophy of science. And it it has really connected. <laughs> it's it's sort of like this book that that um I kind of wish I knew about earlier because I feel like I've been wandering aimlessly in this space about like Karl Popper, Thomas Kuhn, the Korean Revolution, and oh yeah, all this stuff that happened about uh, when you know when science actually became science and it kind of broke away from what philosophy was and uh, scholasticism and and uh, you know these these sort of uh, different critical influences on, uh, takes on science and why it didn't happen and 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 the age of you know in the age of enlightenment and 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 it kind of just like <laughs> in, in in the opening like round of it it's like oh yeah let's just weave some interesting narratives that are critical and and like let's let's um let's sort of look at uh, even even just this part and, and even even talking about why like do you want to talk about this in a chronological way or do you want to talk about this in a thematic way and, and I just think, oh, like this is really like one of the better texts trying to actually look at these things that I've seen. Um, so that's it was quite exciting to find. Um, and I think will help much more better help shape um, some of the philosophy history of science efforts I'm talking about and kind of be thinking more of a bedrock actually actual piece. And it was sort of the classic, yes, we're 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 historians of science and we don't really have a text. We need the text to teach, uh, uh, do a survey uh, of our information, and and go we give to our under, to the undergrads or to people looking to do this, but also still be accessible to X Y Z, and do this rigorously. And I was like, here, here, so we made this book. I was like, oh great, that's basically something that I've been looking for, and I'm, I'm really, uh, it's been it's been great great to read so far. So at some point, I might even go through. Probably not today, but in the future, I might even like just like let's you know, do a presentation on parts of it because it seems super relevant to um, some of that stuff. But those are my bullet points. Um, and if you wanted to do your update, maybe we can. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, congratulations to uh, Hussein and Jesse for uh, submitting some things to the EI workshop. The deadline was kind of like March first. So that's good that they got them in, and I'm looking forward to seeing those presentations uh, coming up because the conference is on the 22nd, or I guess the 20, 20 through the 22nd. Hello, Hussein. And, uh, you know, so we, we have to keep on top of that. You know, it's you have to get the slides ready, and um, I like to record mine before, but you don't have to do that. I'd like to actually get a recording from each of you for your presentation, if, if you wouldn't mind, just for the uh, YouTube channel, on the Lab's YouTube channel, because we usually fo uh, feature those talks. So, you know, there are 10 minutes. You just, you know, we can, you can get me the recording or we can, I can help you record it if you need and we can put it up there. And, and it's, it's a lot longer lasting if you do it that way, because we can get, um, you know, more eyes on it because uh, the, conference has you know it's like the uh, I guess it's a breakout session during the conference so you know it's limited in who's seeing it uh, I don't think they record put the post the recordings of the breakout rooms uh, for that conference so it would be especially good to have like a record of that and something that people can easily cite or look up for future reference so uh, yeah well we'll talk about that more maybe in the coming weeks as we get closer to the deadline. So I guess Morgan wanted to give an update oh. on Neuromatch. Yeah, it's a UCSD or... Uh, UCSF. UCSF, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm in San Francisco, man. That's where I thought. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, that doesn't look like that can't be. It can't be UCSD. Yeah, yeah. It, I just know. got misplaced in the middle. Sorry, yeah. we're, we're, we're all anti-SoCal in this, this household. Uh, no offense. No offense. Good to uh, um, uh, my daughter's in UCLA, you know, so she, she, she knows from experience. Um, uh, yeah, just a quick update on the, um, <laughs> the quick update on, um, the Neuromatch meeting this week, which was, which was cool. Um, so there's a networking event and, um, 
Um, and I think we were supposed to have a mix of neuro and um, climate match uh, people. Uh, I, I uh, now not everything went smoothly. Oh, okay. <laughs> we. we we, we the, the, a, a small subset of us ended up in our own room with no breakout rooms um, and, you know, surviving uh, Lord of the Fly style. Um, and, uh, uh, with, Lord with of the no Fruit host. Flies? Yeah. Well, <laughs> Lord, of, Lord of the Drusala. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we were, we, were, we were pretty much a neuro group. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 again, I don't know if there was just a heavy skew to neuro oh. because, like, they were, you know, neuro was the first uh, neuro match. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, it, it, was, it was interesting. Um, you know, I love these events. I love the... I love this, you know, this particular organization in terms of coming out of the pandemic, and um, and, and like um, Jesse posted, they've um, they announced or registration opened. Uh, so the, the the networking event was Monday, and um, the classes were announced or you know registration opened for for the Neuromatch Academies. Uh, um, um, Friday, and that includes a new neuro AI, or I think that's new. Is that right? Anyway, I, I don't remember neuro AI before, but um, I could be wrong. And um, uh, now I also saw that Nick uh, Nick Halper, who's the CEO of Neuromatch, and as he and I have done a, um, a NeuroTechX event before. Um, and he was also representing Climate Match at the NASA. Um, I forget what the the initiative is called, but I, I've posted it in Open Science before, like transition to Open Science or something like that. Anyway, he um, I got to see. Sorry, I'm quickly checking our Open Science channel. I think I've posted that um yeah this is in the slack yeah um i don't see it but it might have disappeared under our three-month window yeah. anyway um was still really hoping to learn more or you know was was hoping to interact with more climate people just because of their reliance on um computational fluid dynamics as well as um, in the, oh, where did this come up? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so, so somewhere, it, it, it might have come up in the recent new Steve Brunton videos okay. um, that are covering, you know, physics informed neural networks, but um, the lack of governing equations in climate science for for things that you wouldn't think about or i i didn't think about at first in terms of um things like clouds cloud formation being so important for especially like heating models and you know so it's one 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 thing for us to think about just <clears throat> you know ideal gas laws and things like that and you know, imagining that happening on a sphere or something like that. But um, what he was pointing out was that, you know, because because cloud formation is this multi-scale phenomena, we don't have good governing equations for it. That, you know, th there's, there's, you know, some of the, the, the heart of, you know, climate, climate science problems yeah. and, and, you know, would have been really interesting to, to learn more about that um, uh, uh, in terms of their current attempts at modeling, things like that. But certainly, you know, really, really enjoyed um, Brunton's videos and their, their possibilities in, in um, uh, you know, neural, neural analysis. Um, and I saw that um, 
and also cosine started this week. Okay, yeah. So um, I, I think I dropped just one link in neuroscience networks. Yeah, I, I, I just dropped a link for the open opening remarks and um, as nice to see, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, okay, take care. Uh, um, and Bing Brunton is is actually did the opening sessions for okay, <laughs> for yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, and I I think she was saying that it's 20, 20 years, 20, 20th anniversary. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, it, maybe anyway. Um, so uh, all of those those videos are online, um, and uh, next week. Um, like mid midweek workshops start, okay. and you know, and uh, there's definitely a lot of good workshops. I, I already saw some, you know, kind of like deep learning, computer vision, animal behavior projects that that had met, you know, like cosine related meetings. Um, uh, anyway, later the, um, I'm. Just getting started here, but uh, I'll just collect a couple of the really interesting um, um, papers and and announcements. That uh, anyway, but right. good for now. Yeah, well, thank you, Morgan, for the update. Um, so, uh, uh, Sara, hello. I don't know if you had any updates you wanted to give or anything. Questions. Uh -huh. Not really. Uh, I mean, I uh, like I've been attending these meets for the past two weeks, and I've just been trying to do that to get a general idea of like what what do you do because I come from a software engineering background, and I'm interested in the GSOC project as an expose. Uh, but I don't have a lot of the neuroscience or that kind of background, so yeah. I've just been trying to hang around and uh, adjust, uh, like understand those things. And uh, I like. Uh, I am interested in one of the projects and I know the process is to talk to you and I'm hope, like I'm planning to do that. Uh, like I, think I was doing a little bit of background research. So I was just doing that this past week. So I'll, I think I'll reach out to you personally and talk more there or I can share more, whatever it is. Or if you have more, uh, if you have a set agenda, I'll just make it. That, that sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, so you know the one of the things we do in, in these meetings, anyways, is we kind of have this cross pollination where people come from different backgrounds and we feature things from different areas and and people learn about things and so you know we we don't expect people to become or to be well versed in all these areas coming in, but it, you get exposure to them. And so the GSOC projects are yeah they're not really. Yeah, they're not really neuro related directly, but you know, these are things that like I, I think I've said before, we're going to have an open source meeting on Fridays as well. This it's gonna start uh back up in a couple weeks where we talk specifically about like open source development and some of the more software engineering type things and so that should be fun too. And and I think, you know, I'm gonna try to help people with their projects in G for GSOC. So, you know, if you want to get, you know, if you want to have a one-on-one, -on -one, I can do that. You know, we can schedule things as we get closer to the proposals when they need yeah, to be submitted. Okay. I'll, I'll reach out to you as well once I come up with a little bit of my background work. Okay, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering what Neurostart was. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a mistake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's a good name. Yeah, yeah. Well, name. That's, yeah. We should get that domain. <laughs> we should take it. Take it. You know? I, I, think it uh, I think it fits like a lot of the embryogenesis stuff. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, I like that. I was thinking onboarding for neuro-related projects. What? We could do parallels for neurogenesis <laughs> yeah. onboard. So I'm going to share my screen, and I want to go over some things uh, with respect to GSOC. Um, so first of all, we've been trying to get up everything up and running. Um, if you go to neurostars.org, this is the site that INCF runs, and this is actually their uh, discourse instance. So you know, discourse is a discussion 
board where they have different buckets of uh, thing. And Neurostars used to be this uh, sort of Q&A uh, web forum for neuroimaging. And so they have a lot of stuff on neuroimaging. But for our purposes for GSOC, we can ignore that and go right to their GSOC uh, discussion, which is here. And so if you go here, this is where you can get a description of our projects and all, in fact, all the projects for that INCF is sponsoring for GSOC this year. So uh, we have a number of projects. Ours, if you, you look at GSOC 2024, because if you go to the uh, GSOC uh, uh, group, you know, you'll have like ones from past years. And although, you know, our projects didn't change from last year too much, uh, please consult the 2024 version. So there are a couple that we have that I, actually I'm a mentor for. Uh, one of them is uh, this Graph Neural Networks project. This is through the Open Learn Foundation. And this is a project that uh, is going through our DevoLearn group. So if you attend our DevoLearn, uh, DevoLearn meetings, you can, um, you know, learn more about this. You'd be working with that group rather than the uh, Orel group, but still, you know, there is some overlap, and, and indeed we bring things from Devo Worm into this meeting, so, um, or into this group. So we, we have this project uh, 4.1. This is for 2024. This is Graph Neural Networks. So if you're interested in Graph Neural Networks, which are uh, a, a certain type of uh, neural network that relies on graph embeddings, uh, this is the kind of project that you might be interested in, in um, participating in. So we've worked on this project for the last couple of years. We have this larger platform called Devo Learn, which is a, you know image processing using deep learning, using pre-trained models, things like that. We already have a, a presence for that project uh, in a number of places. Uh, we have some tools there that can be used to derive these graph embeddings. So we've worked on Devo Graph for a number of years. We've uh, sort of tried to integrate it with some of those tools. And, but the idea behind this year's Devo Graph is that people develop the graph embeddings and develop some of the higher level analytical tools. Uh, you can you know, uh, work on some of the models for uh, image processing as well, but that's not a main focus of it. So that's project 4.1. That's actually not through this group directly, but it's through the Open Learn Foundation, but I'm also the mentor of it. Now, so then 5.1 5, 5 and 5.2 are the ORL projects. Uh, we'll talk about 5.2 here. This is open source community sustainability. Um, and if you look at the length of the projects, uh, I think it's like 175 and 350 hours. So 175 is sort of like the normal length and 350 hours are the larger length projects. And if you know anything about GSOC, you know that like they have these two project lengths. You know, one is a smaller project, one is a larger project that lasts longer. Um, and it's in, 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 as a result, the 350 hour projects should propose a little bit broader scope to them. So, you know, I don't want people to, I want people to get the scaling right on the timing. So. If you're proposing for a 175 hour project, uh, then that's going to be different than a 350 hour project. So this project is a 350 hour project. Uh, so in this uh, project, we worked on this for a couple of years as well. We've done a lot of things with uh, developing tools for looking at open source communities and how they organize themselves and how to make, make them sustainable. Is a lot of open source projects fail because not necessarily because people don't want to do things. It's not because they don't have the will. Sometimes that's the problem, but because their organization is not optimized or it isn't something that people want to be a part of. So a lot of projects fail because of that. So this, uh, what we're trying to do here is develop tools and models to help us understand why those failures occur. And so there are a number of things under this project. There's a, a open a sustainability auditing tool that we've been working on for the past couple of years. There are these uh, agent-based models that you can work on. People have expressed interest in the reinforcement learning model that we have that uh, 
was worked on last year, uh, but and the year before. But we also have other models, especially in the area of active inference, that I would like to see people kind of take to the next level. So this project, like the uh, GNN's project, is sort of like taking what's existing to the next level. And we have repos uh, on these different things. We have a GSOC repo on our uh, GitHub site, our uh, ORL slash group uh, site. But and you can fork that and contribute accordingly. So I had a question about that this week. Uh, you know, how do you contribute? We we don't really have a lot. We don't keep our issue board open like in the off season, as it were. But you know, you can fork the repository and make commits as needed. So that's five point two. Then five point one is here. And this is the virtual reality for distributed research. This is a 175 hour project. So it shouldn't propose, it shouldn't be as ambitious as like so, say a proposal for the open source sustainability project. But you know, for the virtual reality for distributed research project, what we're looking for are people who want to work on building assets for virtual environments, or taking some of the assets that we had from last year and creating things like um, you know, an app for like the MetaQuest or, you know, something that can be interacted with more easily. So there are a lot of issues of taking that to the next level or creating your own project or creating new assets that sort of present information in a different way. So uh, the Openworm Foundation has this browser, it's browser.openworm.org. You know, that's something that you can work on as a tool uh, turning that from like a, a interactive 3D model in a web browser to something you can interact with in virtual in the, in a virtual world, and you know the the sort of the way that you do that is you take the existing software written in Python and you add features like different viewpoints, different ways to manipulate the worm, and so forth. Uh, there's also this idea of visualizing agent-based models as in the first-person view and in the third-person view. So as if you were an element or if you were an agent in that simulation or if you're looking down on the simulation uh, at all the agents doing their thing. And so, you know, there, there are different ways you can use virtual reality that are very much, um, you know, unique in terms of uh, both computing and interaction that, you know, I'd like to see people sort of explore more. Uh, the, the third thing here is the Morris Water Maze project, which is basically where you create an, a famous experimental paradigm. So last year, um, one, of the th one of the assets that was created was a Morris Water Maze model. And, you know, the way, ways it can be improved, one of the ways it can be improved is to have it to be more interactive with respect to the experimental design. So we can work on that together to build in some of those features. We can also build uh, other types of, you know, experimental uh, settings, not just the Morris Water Maze, but there are a lot of experiments in psychology and neuropsychology that can be replicated in a virtual environment. And the benefit there is you can control a lot of the parameters that people interact with. Um, and so that's that's something that we can talk about. Um, so. For this project, we actually have a Discord. This is the principles of bits to matter to mind. And this is something uh, uh, that we have that has a lot of stuff on VR. So we have a number of channels here, topical channels uh, on different topics in virtual reality and some that are allied to virtual reality. So a lot of things with, uh, you know, with different technologies, different concepts, and open source uh, knowledge and things like that. So there are a lot of things you can learn by uh, joining this Discord and going through some of the things that are here. A lot of tools that are out there, so you don't have to always start from scratch. Um, you know, and uh, if, if you want to do something, you can consult some of these channels and see, or contribute to this Discord uh, to to talk about some of the ideas that you have. So. There are a lot of tie-ins from virtual reality to things like uh, machine learning and other types of modeling 
we, you know, so there's this idea of neural radiance fields or NERFs being used in VR. There are also things, uh, open source tools like Mozilla Hubs open sourcing their platform so that you can host it on your own server. Or this Project North Star, which is a headset that you can build from parts that you can 3D print. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do, a lot of development kits. And so, you know, one of the ways, one of the things we'd like to do is be able to make this easier for easier for people to navigate. That's and that can be maybe part of your project. Uh, you know, de, as you kind of develop your software, you can also and you can even propose working on hardware if you want. Although I would be very um, uh, conservative about that. I wouldn't try to like propose anything really complex for GSAP uh, for reasons that are obvious. Um, and then, you know, so, but, but another part of this is making this space easier to navigate for people because there are a lot of tools and a lot of things that are kind of like, you know, experimental. So finding like the best tools or finding the best way forward to do some, you know, development for research or for other types of experiential things is really something that's needed. And so that's another thing you can do as well. So that's the GSOC, uh, those are the GSOC proposals. Um, I wanted to go over those to, to give people an idea of what, what uh, we're looking for. And again, that, that's very high level. I can meet with people one-on-one -on -one to talk about their proposals. You can send uh, me or Jesse messages in Slack about uh, mentorship aspects of this. So, you know, what is the right size of a proposal or is this a good idea to pursue? And we can give you quick feedback on that. We're not going to walk you through by the hand. You know, we're not going to take your hand and walk you through it. But we can give you, you know, an idea of whether something is viable or if it's a good idea or not. Because we've been, you know, I know Jesse's been involved in the lab for uh, several years now. And I've, of course, mentored for many years on GSOC. So I know and what's viable and what's not. And so that's that's my uh, suggestion. And then if you want us to review your, or at least me to review your proposals, I can take a look at them after you've gotten them in good shape. And you know, you you, know, you want some feedback on whether something is good, or uh, maybe like something that's acceptable, I guess. Because the scoping the pro problem is really the hardest part of this. Proposing something that's viable mm -hmm. is, is the best part. Is the hardest part. It's the best part to focus on. Because you really need to have that down to be successful. Oh yeah, <coughs> I was going to add these two points. Excuse me before before we left. Um, I think one of the biggest questions, or like things that comes up a lot in proposals, is like, oh, like how detailed do I need to be with like my timeline, and what if this happens, this happens. I would say like, it's great to really be thoughtful about that, but don't don't. I, I, I'm trying to think of the best ways to like convey what what that part should be because it's I'm not sure what examples we, we could even like show or how much we'd want to show as an example because basically you, you want to convey that you're thinking and kind of demonstrating your project development thinking about it like how will it evolve over time or what if it doesn't work or like are you kind of aware that it may not be a perfect development process you know we'll, but like just the general like it's almost like as a way to showcase your thinking about how you see project development um but also like we're not expecting you don't need extremely detailed you know hour by hour assessment of what what you want to do like on this date um and i think barely can maybe speak to that the best um but the the the, the other point I would mention is another cool aspect and plug for um, working with us. And we, we're not really doing this at the moment in an overt way, but we have a lot of really, um, one of my favorite things about the lab is that there's a lot of focus on developing uh, the, the researcher or like you could say like early career professional development ideas and advice. That's something we incorporated last year a little more intentionally into our cool summer code stuff. 
Um, and I, Bradley's, the, the lab, always, as far as I'm concerned, was always like super oriented towards giving that space and, and working with people to, to, to develop like foundational skills to do research or, or the software development projects like this. Um, but I think like there's even more of an intentional focus on the last year. And I really, I look forward to that too, because I think that's sort of, it's not just um, you know, the project, but it's also like we took covers topics like, you know, dealing, dealing with giving, giving and receiving feedback in, in like job settings or in research settings, uh, like, like some fundamentals to writing or fundamentals to presenting, talking about like, you know, demo or die as concepts. And what does that actually mean in a functional way? Um, so those, those are like, I think, kind of a bonus thing that not every place offers that, that is a, a nice, like that's like really baked into um, the lab. And and I, I, I think that deserves a shout out to mention too, uh, for like, you know, cool things, cool things to look forward to um, during, during the summers, uh, summers of the year. Yeah. Yeah. So our... We have uh, two, and I'll talk about two YouTube channels. The first is the uh, Orthogonal uh, Research and Education Lab channel. And you can just go to YouTube and, and put that in the search and you can bring it up. And we have a lot of our meetings on there. One of the things we have is an open source channel where you can look at some of our meetings from last year. And we did a lot of this sort of professional development uh, in, in those Friday meetings. So we did, you know, aside from the GSOC, uh, projects themselves, giving updates on that. We also did a number of things for professional development, which I think was very well received by a lot of people because it, you know, it helps you kind of when you go on p beyond your GSOC project, you know, how do I interact with the world as a professional? How do I deal with certain problems that come up? So that's good. Uh, the other thing is our, uh, uh, this is the Diva Worm uh, YouTube channel. So this is actually a playlist from that uh, channel, and this is called Lab Meetings. And so uh, we have Diva War meetings on Mondays, and they're uh, in the morning in North America. So this is something that maybe not everyone can attend, or maybe you can attend it in the evenings uh, live, but then we also have this meeting that's recorded. And so we have an archive of these meetings. Uh, so every week we have a Diva War meeting. And we try to like, you know, get together and maybe talk about ideas, talk about different topics. So you can see from the subtitles on these meetings that, you know, we, we cover a, a wide range of topics. Now, the Diva Worm meetings are about developmental biology, but they're also about computation. And so it's sort of under this rubric of computational developmental biology with, you know, some, a lot of things that kind of go out from there. So, you know, we talk about, uh, biophysics. We talk about artificial life. We talk about evolution. We talk about uh, things like, you know, uh, simulations. Uh, we talk about machine learning, deep learning. Uh, all of those topics are just kind of like getting at, you know, if, if things come up that we, we like, you know, certain papers that we like or certain topics that we're working on, we usually present them in this meeting. So last week we talked Actually, I gave a little bit of a talk on some of the open source community resources for DevoWorm. And that's something you might check out if you're interested in the uh, Graph Neural Networks project or even in the Virtual Reality project because there's some resources there that might be useful for that. We also talked about Rule 30, which is this concept in cellular automata and how that can be used to simulate biological systems or not. And we talked about a case where maybe that's not the best explanation. So there, we do a lot of these kind of discussions on different topics. So, um, you know, check this out if you're interested. It's very much, um, you know, a resource. Uh, so that's, you know, and then we have, so we have that YouTube presence and I think that really explains that, you know, you could really mine that and find a lot of things. We've been continually trying to mine that for uh, you know, to go back and say, what have we been talking about for the last month or two months? And it's really interesting some of the stuff that emerges from that. We haven't done that in a while, but, um, you know, that that's another way you can kind of 
get a sense of what's going on in the lab and some of the maybe some of the themes that are going through the lab and um, if that's helpful to your GSOC projects then that's great if you're interested more generally in you know research themes and, and interesting things to talk about that's also a great resource so um, okay any questions at this point comments Okay, now I want to move on to some things. So I actually, this is something from like a long time ago we never talked about. Um, so this is a, a recap of Europe's 2023. And, you know, one of the things we've talked about in under the neurosimulation aspect is, you know, we want to talk about things like machine learning and deep learning and reinforcement learning. And we want to keep on top of that field. We've, we used to do that a lot more, but we've kind of, moved away from that just, just because it's so unwieldy, the space. And so one of the things they do, um, a lot of people have done, because the people who attend uh, NeurIPS tend to be people who want to optimize their research experience. So they have a lot of these uh, features where they kind of go through uh, the, the main conference in their field, and they try to summarize things as much as possible. And so I've seen a lot of really good summaries of NeurIPS and some of the workshops uh, from people who are attendees to kind of generate these uh, artifacts. And so this is great. Um, this is a recap of NERPS 2023, which was last December. Um, and so they kind of go through some of the posters here. So this is an interesting map of uh, poster space that I've not seen before. But uh, this kind of talks about the different topics that you have at NERPS. So if you've never been to NeurIPS, it's a huge conference. It's not, I don't think it's quite as big as the uh, SFN conference for neuroscience, but this is a huge conference where you have a lot of posters. So if you don't have tools like this, it's very easy to like just get lost and like not get the most out of your experience. But this is sort of an analysis of the different poster topics. So let's see what they're doing at NeurIPS 2023. So this is by Hendrik Strobelt and Benjamin Hoover. This is from the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. And, you know, they have these clusters of topics, and they do this both sort of in a supervised way, finding labels for them uh, topically, but also these uh, keywords that they use uh, to find clusters. So like any good uh, machine learning person, they've, they've done this both ways. So we have uh, topics like diffusion, segmentation, language models. Now there's overlap between language models and diffusion, and language models and segmentation. We have diffusion one, we have biomed, we have causal, bandits, federated learning, reinforcement learning. So federated learning and reinforcement learning overlap a little bit. Um, and so there are all these different approaches or all these different topical areas. The causal uh, systems or causal methods are a very hot topic. Uh, bandits are a very hot topic in terms of like having a way to sort of, um, you know, generate decisions and decision making, uh, random processes, things like that. Of course, language models are, are very large and, and represented well, reinforcement learning, and then diffusion being a newer technique that's very popular, you're going to have a lot of that. And then things like biomed, which are applied aspects as well. And so this cluster here, they just want to show their methodology. They have these different words, uh, these, these keywords like learning, adversarial, via, efficient, data, models, robustness, uh, distillation, data set, transfer, and backdoor. So these are a combination of things that you might expect, but also topics that are hot in the field. So that's a nice uh, recap. This is, of course, a picture of the conference experience. And so, yeah, there were a lot of, uh, there were over 3,000 papers, as you can imagine. That's uh, an impossible task to pick the best papers from all of those, unless they're really kind of featured uh, prominently. But we don't necessarily want to just rely on the prominent uh, aspect of the paper. We want to find the real gems. And sometimes those real gems can be hidden. So we want to be able to find ways to find that.
So they, they've got a lot of tools for this. They have the VizHub guide, which is a T-Sneak cluster in your papers. Uh, lots also happened in the archive publishing world outside of NeurIPS. Uh, Carpathy gave a highlight of this in his Twitter feed, especially DeepMinds Beyond Human Data, scaling self-training for problem solving with language models. So there's a lot going on in the field. If you go to, to archive, you know, that's, that's another resource. But of course, the archive uh, categories for machine learning are arguably even harder to navigate than NeurIPS. So there are a lot of tools for that as well. So if you want to get a good handle on the field, you have to know how to navigate it. Um, so they have this, uh, so they have the NeurIPS Best Paper Award, um, and they go through a selection of non-awarded but highly influential papers in this post. Um, Sebastian Roshka actually gave a, on, I think his um, Substack gave a, a list of the 10 best papers, including something called Pythia, which is, a, I guess, a technique. So, yeah, let's see. So the papers that they cover in this post, uh, there's this word to vec paper, uh, distributed representations of words and phrases and their compositionality. Um, you uh, also have our emergent abilities of large language models and mirage. So this is, again, talking about some of these emergent abilities that large language models exhibit and whether they're sort of this, uh, you know, whether they're more than just kind of uh, emergence. There's this concept in the emergence literature, weak versus strong emergence, where, you know, weak emergence is where things just kind of emerge without too much uh, causality and strong emergence is where there's this uh, very strong emergence signal that may be caused by things like causality. So, um, this is, so the, the key to the second paper is, so while emergent abilities may still exist, they should be properly controlled. And re researchers should consider how the chosen metric interacts with the model. The third paper is direct preference optimization. Your language model is secretly a reward model. So it's arguing that uh, a lot of un unsupervised language models, which are sort of the LLM is a category of language model. So there are a lot of language models that aren't these large language models. Um, and so it's worth considering that if language models are basically uh, interact with or maybe even are a class of reinforcement learning. And so they talk here about how unsupervised language models align with different preferences uh, and so you can manage that with reinforcement learning from human feedback or our RLHF. And so RLHF itself is a hard procedure to implement. So thinking about this interaction is important, but we need to develop better methods. So in this paper, we leverage a mapping between reward functions and optimal policies to show that this constrained reward maximization problem can be optimized exactly with a single stage of policy training. So this is interesting work. Um, the next paper is scaling data constrained language models. And this is again, this idea of sc uh, model scaling. So this is a very hot topic in the literature. And that is, as you make the models bigger, what does their performance look like? Sometimes there are scaling laws that we can extract from you know testing models of different sizes, and looking at their performance. So as the size of the model increases, the number of parameters increases, or the number of training tokens increases, we should expect to see an increase in performance. And oftentimes we do, and in a very systematic way, so we can look at the scaling of these of these models. Uh, and their work is uh, post, it, it's, it's hosted on Hugging Face, so that's an open source model to look at. This uh, model is Qlora, or this paper is called Qlora, efficient fine-tuning of quantized large language models. And so this is just working with the large language model paradigm and kind of working on a more efficient version of that. There's data comp in search of the next generation of multimodal data set. So this is focusing on data. Uh, multimodal data sets are a critical component in recent break breakthroughs such as CLIP, Stable Diffusion, and GPT-4. So there's a lot of these generative models and so getting generative models or 
text to image models to work well, it requires multimodal data sets that have different types of data in them, different modalities of data, and it makes it easier to make that conversion from, like, say, text to images or text to video. Uh, so to address the shortcoming in the machine learning ecosystem, we introduced DataComp, a testbed for data experiments centered around a new candidate pool of 12.8 billion image text pairs from Common Call. And so they have our best baseline data comp uh, 1B enables training a clip uh, VIT L14 from scratch to 79.2% zero shot accuracy in ImageNet outperforming OpenAI's clip model by 3.7 percentage points while using the same training procedure and compute. So this whole field is based around these benchmarks where you compare different algorithms on the same data set or on maybe uh, different techniques on the same algorithm and you get a performance uh, that you can then compare with other methods. So this is what they're doing here. They're getting better performance uh, than the state of the art. Um, then there's this paper visual instruction tuning. Uh, this is where they introduce LAVA or LLAVA, Large Language and Vision Assistant, an end to end train large multimodal model that connects a vision encoder and LLM for general purpose vision and language understanding or visual and language understanding. So, this is again one of these multimodal uh, models that you know requires multimodal training data. But it's something that, um, you know, as we develop models, we don't want to just focus on sort of the best large language model we can make. The most powerful one, we also want to introduce other uh, parts of uh, cognition, I guess you could say. So you're combining language with vision. And of course, we've talked in past meetings about why those things are important. Um, this, this paper is Tree of Thoughts. Deliberative problem solving with large language models. This is again, um, this is open source on GitHub, and it kind of talks about how language models are being deployed for general problem solving, but are still confined to token level left to right decision making processes during inference. So that means that they they have a lot of blind spots in terms of doing things like planning and exploration and other types of things. So they come up with a new uh, framework for language model inference, tree of thoughts, which generalizes over the popular chain of thought approach to prompting language models where you prompt the model with some text and you get an answer and enables exploration over coherent units of text that serves as intermediate steps towards problem solving. So there are a lot of really creative ways people are thinking about these models and you know making them better. Then there's tool former language models can teach themselves to use tools. Uh, so this is like self tutoring. It's an interesting kind of approach. Uh, Voyager, an open ended embodied agent with large language models. So now people are starting to bring in embodiment and sort of the aspects of embodiment, uh, where there's auto curriculum, there's a skill library, and iterative prompting mechanisms that encourage feedback. So this is something that interacts with GPT-4. And so this is something, this is a figure that kind of shows them doing some experiments in Minecraft where they show like some things that they're in Minecraft that uh, the model is interacting with and showing the number of items increasing with the number of prompting iterations increasing. Um, it's kind of an interesting approach. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, people are using Minecraft for a lot of things now. And that's another thing that if you're interested in one of the GSOC projects, you could build, you know, an instance of Minecraft, you know, integrating like machine learning models and research. You know, there, there are a lot of creative things you can do in that space. Just uh, to, the, to that point, a, a lot of people are pushing crafter. Okay. Uh, uh, over Minecraft um, because it's um, you know it's basically like having the complexity but less bas basically being more efficient. Yeah. And, and um, you know, yes, there was some sort of Java joke in there somewhere. 
<laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess because Minecraft is the most commonly known platform, but it is kind of still not really made for kind of the things people are trying to use them for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. One of the one of the great, or you know, one of the really interesting um, matches from the the Neuromatch networking was um, a postdoc at Stanford working on on like reinforcement learning work with world models. Okay. And so it, it, you know, and he had some he had some good stuff to say about that. Um, and um, yeah. I, I actually I sent him the um, the saffron call for proposals um, and uh, and I think he, well, he he said he might try and send something in. Okay, yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's great. Um, let me go back to our little Hussein. Uh, yeah, the next paper is evaluating cognitive maps and planning in large language models with Cogivex. So this is um, where recently an influx of studies claim emergent cognitive abilities in large language models, yet most rely on anecdotes, overlook contamination of training sets, or lack systematic evaluations. And so this is, of course, their uh, way to evaluate this. So these are what you might call cognitive benchmarks that allow us to look at some of the, you know, to basically test the model for cognitive abilities. So there are a lot of things in, like, looking at spatial cognition of the models or, you know, planning abilities of the models. And so they, they have this, this is just an image of sort of the latent structure of different environments and seeing if the models can pass these benchmarks. And so that's interesting that people are kind of exploring this space and not, you know, I mean, because a lot of these debates about whether uh, models are sentient or whether models are exhibiting awareness aren't really based on anything more than an intuition. So having these kind of tools in place are good for kind of getting at some of these questions. Uh, that, that, that looks good. Is that um, Ida Mamanajad? Uh, is it? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, 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 okay. Microsoft Research. So great. Uh, and then this is her, Ida, at her poster. So that's great. Uh, then the next paper is Mamba, Linear Time Sequence Modeling with Selective State Spaces. Uh, foundation models, which we haven't talked about too much, uh, and we've talked about how that's kind of an ill-defined term, but um, well, actually we may talk about foundation models in Devalor this Monday, so well, I look forward to that discussion. Uh, foundation models now powering most of the exciting applications in deep learning are almost universally based on the transformer architecture and its core attention module. And so uh, the key weakness of such models is their inability to perform content-based reasoning. And then so they're proposing several improvements uh, to this. Uh, you know, some of them are algorithmic. Some of them are, you know, handling parameters. Uh, and then they show that in their model Mamba, it enjoys fast inference. It's uh, higher throughput than a transformer-based foundation model and has the scaling property um, that, you know, is comparable with the state of the art. And so then on language modeling, our Mamba model, 1.4 billion parameter model, uh, performs transformers of the same size and matches transformers twice its size. So they're proposing this model that's actually outperforming the state of the art, which are transformers for uh, these uh, foundation models. Okay, so that looks good. That's that's all they have, and and that's you know a nice subsampling of what's going on in that field and what's what was going on at Neurips. So I wanted to get. I know it's been a while since uh, that event happened, but I think it's good to reflect on you know some of the things that are going on because there's just so much going on in the field and so much you, you go to a conference and you just it's it's overwhelming <laughs> and I don't even know what the point is but you do get these nice summaries that kind of go over the best things the most interesting things if we have any comments or questions
Yeah, I, I, I'd seen a couple. Um, I'd seen a couple tweets with various like, you know, U maps or, oh, yeah. you know, uh, of of the, the posters and abstracts and things like that. In terms yeah. of, you know, getting getting you know people trying to get a sense of the. Um, you know the mood of the conference you know or the 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 the, the hot topics yeah. uh, in terms of what was what was dominating and um and again it it, it um uh you know I, it, like it is one of those it is one of those skills that we're really hoping that agents will be able, or these tools will be able to actually help us with, right? Yeah. In the sense of, of um, you know, there, there are way too many abstracts for any human to actually take in all that information, right? Yeah. So how do we, how do we, um, uh, in, in what ways can we, um, algorithmically, you know, um, s- s- summarize, but but you know, in in ways where we're actually gaining information from that, right? So it's not just like you know, summary statistics of the the number of posters or you know how how many words did they use or something like that, right? We want to get it. We want to get at some of the real content. And um, and you know, um, yeah. How how can we? Um, and what what are even good approaches to that? Yeah. <laughs> like like you know, and I, I I think some of us use particular thought leaders to, you know, be there talking to people, and you know, you certainly come away with s- s- some some top people get get highlighted because they've done stuff in the past <laughs> uh right. you know um so like you know I, I was already i was already you know from your from your um vr open worm i was all i had a different paper of item <laughs> that i i wanted to talk about right so yeah. you know um but no surprise that she'd be in the top 10 list here um uh, it, it, it just makes me think of something else, you know something something related so um uh ken i think it's ken stanley right yes um uh so ken stanley has left open ai okay right yeah and and what what is he doing well um he's started a new social network Oh right, I saw this. <laughs> you know, uh, and yeah, yeah, Maven, right? Uh, uh, you know, starting a starting <laughs> starting a social network sounds a little like, uh, and and so and, and then we and then we started a hotel, yeah, um, which is online <laughs> from Faulty Towers, if anybody. But yeah, so, so what what's he trying to do again? It's like he he wants a social network that is based on serendipity or, it, it, you know. It's the it's an anti-social network, or, you know, which again is not what he calls it, <laughs> but it, it's right, right. So that his book is greatness cannot be planned or something like that, right? Yeah. And uh, um, this oh, isn't. It looks, like, it looks like my microphone wasn't muted. Sorry, okay. I think I might have been. Sorry about that. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, um, and. Um, Anyway, he, he, he's on Machine Learning Street Talk, which is, again, one of my favorite YouTube channels for catching uh, what, what at least some insiders think are the hot topics. <laughs> and um, uh, he, he talks, about, um, talks about why he started the Maven and you know how how it's supposed to work, and you know what what he hopes we'll we'll get out of it. I liked that um, that he got some some you know because he's known he he's got a lot of uh, a lot of good research people that of course have joined Maven. So 
um, it's got that new founders effect in terms of it's a small core group of really, you know, people that are, are going to be really interesting to follow if you're a researcher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, you know, again, it's not following, you're following topics. Right. right. And, and, anyway, check, check it out. Um, and I, I would be, you know, it, it is being driven by someone who's, you know, it's like I would want to be on a network with him, right? <laughs> and, and and I and I think it would be really interesting to follow topics that he and others that he knows are yeah, following. Yeah. To, you know, <laughs> like like yeah, it, it, it's it's at this point it's going to be a nice curated social network. Um, so should be interesting, but yeah. but it, it, you know it's 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 a huge problem, right? I mean. Right. SFN is is too big to 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 capture, right? Yeah, and and you're kind of lucky if you even kind of follow one subgroup of SFN in terms of being able to, not not to read everything, but just to I don't know, be able to survey the abstracts and know who those people are and what they're what they're talking about, or you know. Um, and and I and I still haven't seen you know despite several projects over the last five years coming out to try and help us with this, I haven't seen any tool become kind of used, uh, except maybe Carpathy's um, archive sanity preserver. Oh right, yeah, that's. I, I would say which is a small you know which 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 I think also says something in the sense that like it, it's such a. You know, it's a really basic PCA on top of a recommender system. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and it's just trying to capture a little tiny sliver of, of uh, archive. Yeah, it's a, definitely a sanity preserver. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing I noticed about this is, like, you know, these papers are increasingly engaging with cognitive science in a lot of interesting ways, I think. And even neuroscience, but more like cognitive mm. science, because you're dealing with multi multimodality, you're dealing with different sensory systems, but then you know you're dealing with the behavior of the model itself, and so this. But it, it's interesting how those interact. It'd be interesting to see what like a kind of a cross section between Neurips and the CogSci conference to see what kind of topics are converging there, or mm. topics are kind of like parallel in parallel that no one's like kind of made those connections between the two or, you know, whatever, because definitely they're, 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 they're sort of parallel rival topics. You know, like if I'm in machine learning research, for example, my idea of vision is, you know, inspired by what's going on in cognitive science and neuroscience, but it's, it's taking its own trajectory. And so it'd be interesting to see people pull that back together and say, wait a minute, where are these going? <laughs> Where are these two different views or multiple views going? And yeah, uh, yeah. just to keep it as a real uh, sanity check, or <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, for sure, for sure. And and, and uh, uh, along those lines, um, one of the really great talks, and I and I forget where I posted. I think oh yeah, in Cognition Futures, <clears throat> there was this talk. Um, that is in the Neurosymbolic YouTube channel. So I, I didn't know this group, but looked them up and it's like an ASU group. It's, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So this uh, Christian, um, how would you pronounce that? Le Beer? Le Beer, yeah. Um, it, 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 anyway, it was, it was a really nice overview of, you know, um, you know, sort of to this point where it's just like trying to bring ACTAR into kind of reinforcement learning research. You, you know what I mean? Like yeah. trying to bring these cognitive models in, in a, in a, um, um, yeah, in, a, in an appropriate fashion. And, and a, as well as connecting it to, um, uh, I forget the guy's name at, um, at, I want to say UC Davis that does kind of whole like like brain modeling, you know, network brain modeling. Um, I forget what the package is called, but you know, and he has a 
compute package pins the L. <laughs> Sorry, this is so vague. Um, he, he's been. He's, uh, I, I've heard him on Brain Inspired. Anyway, it, it's a really nice description, and he, he links it together uh, in in terms of a couple of DARPA projects that are getting at what you were saying, like in terms of trying to bring cognitive science together with this this kind of you know. Um, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, Jesse's interested in metacognition. I don't know yeah. how much. I mean, that definitely it's an approach to it. I mean, you know, but it's, it, we'll have to check it out and see. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely worth it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, I, oh, excuse me. Go ahead. Yeah. Was some, wait, was someone else talking? Oh, okay. I'd be, I'd be, I, I think the medical, I think the medical approaches, the architectural approaches to metacognition are absolutely fascinating. I think, especially in the realm of, say, seeing how the physical connectivity structures of the brain itself could lead up to um, the more, uh, the more, say, soft processes of reflection and introspection and awareness. That's where a lot of, um, a lot of the research should be. Um, I think a lot of the really, really exciting research is taking up. So, um, like, so, so medical, 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 metacognition, uh, approaching it from different angles. And, um, like I, I personally believe it or not, am not so familiar with the neurosymbolic approaches. So, um, that's something to really, to really look into, uh, to really look into. Yeah. 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 I mean, neurosymbolic, I remember we did some, uh, Gary Marcus was hosting some uh, uh, sessions on neurosymbolic AI, and there were some that IBM put on uh, a couple years ago. And it's interesting, you know, it's basically the idea that you have these models that are data driven, and but they're not really, you know, there's they're not symbolic enough. So you have these symbolic models, which were sort of the bread and butter of AI before the data driven models exploded and subsumed all the symbolic models and now people want to bring them back together and so there are a lot of techniques and ways you can do that and that's i think a very fruitful area to you know keep working in and and see what what, what can be done um you know but but you have to start somewhere with metacognition i think first to say this is you know these are these cognitive streams how do you put them together how do we add a symbolic layer and so forth so um, we still, you know, we, we've done some work in the group on metabrains, and we've kind of written a couple papers on that, but we haven't really, I mean, they're, they're obviously next steps to take on that. So that, that's something that we should think more about as well. Um, yeah, I was going to say, basically, that's basically what I was going to say. Um, like, we kind of haven't focused on, like, the AI debates and, and Mark. Uh, some of them were very, very good in the content, um, and we're doing a lot of things with like um, the next, like the next decade in AI, which is this paper either by Marcus or about somebody talking about like sort of Marcus's ideas and and more, more so about hybrid models and, and, and bringing them together, um, Mar Marcus or not. Um, like the, there was sort of um, at the Previous like NeuroPS and, and um, the, one of the other ones I I like attended virtually a few years ago. Um, there were a lot of you know talk about that, and and it's really interesting. It's like kind of it's a nice way to it's in any way to see the different camps too, um, of like. The, like like the Richard Sutton side of things and, and sort of the bitter lesson and like, oh no, let's stay away from this and, and just do this versus hybrid hybrid stuff versus like people who are really strong on the embodiment side of things and what it means or doesn't mean. And, and, and I think it, I, I kind of would like to do a little bit more work there ahead. And we, for those who don't know, we've had a very extensive developmental Breitenberg vehicle set of projects. Actually, that's when I came into the lab, you know, so like pre-pandemic. And, um, it, you know, there's sort of this meta-brain component to it, sort of different 
different structures. It, it, there's some strong, I don't know if analogies are the right word, but similarities to things we've talked about in terms of like some clinician future stuff uh, and um, like, you know, the, the sort of different structures and what they're doing. But yeah, I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't really done anything with metacognition overtly recently. But I'd really be interested in that um, as a means means to maybe connect to past stuff, but also just sort of, you know, I'm curious what what a neuro match and neuro AI will say to somewhat too about that. But but it's sort of um, you know, uh, I don't I don't really know what to say about it in terms of the space that's sort of in this like yes like embodied intelligence will, will have a little bit of something along those lines. And there, there's sort of Bradley mentioned the cognitive science influence on on AI stuff and. I, I, it's a very interesting space because it's it's like something I'm curious about, but also something I don't know. I don't quite know what to make of in the current state, um, but I, I would like to look more into it. I think metacognition, at least the way I've, I've seen it described, is kind of like what goes on on top of like basic cognition, or uh, you know, there are a lot of ways you can interpret that. Right, like so it's very. I mean, maybe I don't know what the the sort of the uh, foundation of this is. Like, what is it that because you, know, you can say something is metacognition, and it's really kind of hard to prove. So you know, unless it, you know, it, it, maybe it's shifting sand. Maybe we can you know, th there's some foundation needs to be built about what metacognition is and. You know, I, I'm not familiar with the field, but I think there's something to say that I, maybe we could say something about it um, in that sense. I, I think there's one interesting dovetail here is like Megan K. Peters was one of like the OG um, near match people. Yeah. She does a lot of things in like philosophy, but also metacognition. It's like, like her, I think one of her approaches was about like how, like, trying to measure how confidently you, you can believe something or not and 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 what it is. She was doing some specific things last I looked at us a year or so ago. Um, but but she's definitely someone that I would be interested in connecting with. I may even actually have asked her about some things about this stuff while ago, but I have to find those discussions. Yeah, I, yeah, I appreciate that. That's that's all really interesting. I guess um for me, epistemically and almost um, exegetically, the question of what is metacognition and what is, meta what is metacognitive, I always um, think it's fascinating to explore where exactly does that come from to begin with? You know, you have your thoughts, you have your cognition, your cognitive processes. So at what point might there need to be any sort of ability to understand those things? And if so, if it's metacognitive, if it's meta, if it's meta, if it's metacognitive, then you understand those processes and those thought processes as not being cognitive themselves. Yet, um, then, you know, how might one resolve this paradox or resolve this problem, separating the cognitive from the metacognitive, separating, you know, this is what I think versus this is what I think that I think. And there's this, there's this constant epistemic barrier that's um, just completely, um, you know, it, it's almost to the root of, I guess, every, every, every argument in philosophy, I suppose, um, um, but anyways, like, uh, like say, say understanding thyself, you can look into the philosophical notions of the self, like the, um, like, is it, uh, is it that you know who you are right now? You know who you were in your past, you know, um, you know that you know who you were, or, and, um, the, the metacognition, um, it's, it's always just like this, uh, this fine, this fine line. It's a very interesting fine line, but it's a fine line. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Uh, definitely, yeah. Um, and if anybody's brought that in, I would say that would be Adam Saffron. Oh, <laughs> or, yeah, you know, well, yeah. Like, like as someone who's tried to, tried to, you know, uh, I mean, in in kind of recent work or recent work that I've seen. Um, right. yeah. So Jesse said, I have a bunch of mantra on a bio of cog terms, bi biology of cognition. In my mind, uh, hinting about all this, and it's trippy because I'm not sure they are the words I want to use to think about them. So, yeah, I mean, definitely some of the stuff we've been doing in cognition futures can be brought to bear on this. So, 
and we, yeah. We, we covered the paper. That's, I think, I don't think some of Michelle Hefferschall and who's at the, at, at the start, the first thing I said at the start of May was this kind of tug and cheek. Like congratulations to everybody in the group for getting through the page because it was, it, it was, it, it was like really profound in some ways and also very just not it, you know not in, in language as it is now, um, as, you know 1970. Um, so very, but also like couch in a cybernetic way of talking about it. So I I, I hear I hear this discussion like oh well, what Charles would say about like you know. Um, what's in the cognitive domain and how like the, the, there's all those pure relations that happen because you can, at the cognitive level, but it has, has to be outside the moment. So metacognition might be something along the lines of things that are happening outside of being in the present or the sort of recursive, you know, um, self, self-referencing self mechanism, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, I'm like, oh yeah, those are all terms that are fresh in my mind, but like, is that how I actually want to talk about this? I don't know. Um, so it was, it was, it's, it's, it's kind of a fun, I don't want to say traumatizing experience, but it's a fun um, thing to think about. I'd be really curious. I'd be really curious about, like, I would love to, to talk to, like, Megan Peters about this specifically. Or, like, I don't know if Levin's written much about metacognition and stuff. I don't think that's quite what he do, but we'll see. Well. Yeah, I think, like I said, you know, there may be many ways to interpret it, uh, which isn't necessarily helpful, but it does help you, like, you know, one thing it might help is to clarify kind of what you mean by metacognition and then go from there. And so I think a lot of the stuff we've been talking about with, like, second-order cybernetics, for, uh, for example, or some of the other things we've been talking about in cognition futures might be helpful there in thinking about, like, you know, models that think about models and think about models which can be traumatizing as you pointed out but um who's <laughs> saying shaking is that now no no i i i know i'm i'm just i'm just, I'm just like <laughs> joking. like you know if it's traumatizing you know perhaps speak to a professional oh yeah yeah definitely <laughs> you've been doing this too much <laughs> do I something know. else yeah like um you know, I mean, speaking speaking of the spectrum, for certain trauma-based disorders or certain psychiatric conditions that are rooted in trauma, they do affect the awareness itself. So they do functionally change your perception of the world and life society, but also as yourself. Like um, borderline personality disorder, one might experience a fragmented sense of self. You know, um, being able to really delve into, you know, what separates, like, I know X versus I know that I know X is... When I, when I was studying philosophy in undergrad, that was... Like the most difficult thing, I could not wrap my head around that. So like, yeah, yeah, and, and again, you know, I mean, uh, partly just this this is fresh in my mind, but yeah, Adam Saffron's discussed some of these, especially about your your body image and you know your body maps um, and, and how central they are. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, particularly for dissociative disorders such as, uh, um, like like parano par ones that experience paranoia due to the dissociation, which is a, a somatic body experience, um, in addition to being mental, and in addition to being in the brain. So yeah. Um, yeah. So this is a great conversation, but I'd like to move on now to other things. Uh, but thanks, yeah, we can continue this in the Slack. Uh, but actually, there's something that is Hussein related I'd like to bring up. Um so in the he posted this in the one of the channels, I can't remember the Slack. And he has this set of things, um it's like this thing he's trying to develop on the ethical considerations related to AI assisted closed loop stimulation. And I thought this was a really interesting sort of start to this. And I know Jesse had expressed some interest and in, and in, so I, I don't know, Hussein, if you wanted to say something sure. about this. Yeah, this this was an idea that had been floating around my head for the past couple of years, and then given other priorities in life, never really got around to. But um, in terms of a very strong ethical argument for a paper to be discussed as it relates to AI and neuroscience, um, what are the ethical considerations related to AI-assisted 
AI-assisted closed-loop stimulation. It seems like it hasn't been written upon. Um, some of the more like thorough, durable ethical stim ethical considerations haven't been elaborated elaborated upon. So so thoroughly, like it seems like people are talking a lot. <laughs> Much of the writing is focused on the functionality of being able to, you know, say, we. Reap the benefits of neurostimulation, but there are some core ethical dilemmas. If you want to scroll down a bit, um, like uh, that come about through the, through this, and I think this could be a very straightforward, um, like discussion-based paper, like writing literature review-based paper, even if it's just outlining the ethical issues themselves and the ethical dilemmas, some ideal ways of approaching them, say from Kantian, you know, Kantian or other points of view too, philosophically, and um, like yeah, yeah, best to look into things like that. So you know, uh, see what we can do and, um, you know, see where the paper leads. Yeah, it looks like we have some uh, publications here that are sort of the seed articles for this. So there's this explainable artificial intelligence component, this XAI component. Uh, and so there's a survey on explainable AI. There's explainable AI and analytical review. Explainable AI for neuroscience, behavioral neurostimulation. That looks really interesting. Um, stop explaining black box machine learning models for high stakes decisions and use interpretable models instead. So there's this, um, you know, need to sort of move away from the black box. Um, and of course, we do that in science when we know more about a phenomenon. Um, and so, but with machine learning, of course, it's that a lot of these processes are. You know, hard to interpret. You, you put a, you get a neural network. You run a neural network. You train it, but you don't know what it's doing inside necessarily. You have to make a point of building the model, building it into the model. So, um, and then of course we have the philosophy of ethics, artificial intelligence. This is from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Uh, new ethical and clinical challenges in closed loop neuromodulation. Closed and open loop brain, deep brain stimulation. So this moves into the uh, brain part of it. And then QED towards a typology of the concept of explanation for the design of explainable AI. So this is like a lot of explainable AI stuff, interpretable models stuff, uh, ethical challenges in, in stimulating the brain and doing things with the brain. I, I don't know if there's anything on brain machine interfaces. Uh, directly as well. That would be a good thing to include. Um, and then I don't know the state of play with, in terms of interpretable models, but there may be some articles on that for like um, sort of applied science, because a lot of the interpretable models work within in like AI. It might be interesting to see if there's some stuff there too. So these core ethical dilemmas, these themes that he's staked out here. The first is electroclinical correlation and dissociation. Uh, the second is patient concerns about device capabilities. Third is clinician opportunities and burdens. And the fourth is data ownership and access. And of course, that one is very key to what you know we're interested in the lab. But there are other topics that are just as interesting. Um, so then he uh, put some XAI terms out there. So. You know, defining transparency, which is the opposite of a black box, explainability, which is related to the notion of explanation as an interface between humans and an AI system, so you can explain what's going on. In this case, you'd have an AI system and a human, and you, or you know, a system that provides feedback in a human, and you want to be able to explain how it works, um, and then. You know, kind of summarizing some of the things that need need to be in here, and the outline of the paper. So this is kind of a uh, uh, call for action. It's also staking out this area, and I don't know. You know, it, I, the you can share. I think the link. I don't know what channel you put it in, Hussein. Uh, I can just share it again right now. Um, okay. I don't think I. Okay, well, I, I got this document together a long time ago, I think like a year ago, okay. but uh, there was no movement on it, so um, we'd like to make it a greater priority for anyone's lab to contribute and uh, get involved in. We can certainly do that. Okay. Um, yeah, I can uh, share it in the, uh, I guess it would be the, maybe like the, you can do this as the which one? Which channel do you want? 
Um, Wait, which, which channel? Which channel might be good? Society Ethics Tech. I think it was. Or... Yeah, that's a good one. That'd be that'd be great because um, yeah, I'm I'm supposed to talk to somebody uh, like next week about neuroethics. So, somebody who's interested in in doing a neuroethics hackathon. And I, I, I was like, what would, what would that be? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I'd, I'd previously, you know, more thinking about psychiatry had thought about privacy issues and um, um, certainly, you know, so like federated learning, I'd thought about, um, you know, hardware um, security issues in terms of, you know, getting access devices and, and we've got some projects from NoiseBridge and um, secure hardware um, or securing hardware. <clears throat> but but um, these look really interesting uh, additional topics, you know, both from an explainability standpoint, which is which is its own, um, you know, subdomain. Um, I, 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 but some things I, I definitely want to read some of those references. And, and I think I'll get some more, even some additional ideas. That's awesome. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm not so sure where this might be pitched to. There is the Artificial Intelligence Ethics uh, Journal. Like, there's that journal. We get something thrown together, it'd be, I, it, would, it would be ideal for that one, too. So I can look into, say, how things are, um, how things are generally written there, what's their style, what do they look for. Maybe, maybe cybernetics, too, like, like the journal Cybernetics. Um, or uh, I'm not so sure of any other good ones, but yeah. So that that would be ideal. Yeah, I, I think I think it'd be a great topic to to yeah talk more about. So, yeah, please drop a link there or show me where that link is. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, it, it should be uh, Society it's Ethics and Tech Channel. And could you post it in the uh, chat here too? You see. There you go. There we go. So it looks like Sara had to leave. Thank you for attending, Sara. Um, yeah, and and so let's yeah let's keep the conversation going on that. It's good to have like, you know, if something gets stuck in a certain place, like if we're working on something and it gets stuck, this is a good opportunity to unstick it by bringing it to the meeting and discussing it a little bit, and maybe hopefully fleshing things out more. But yeah, we'd keep definitely keep going on this. This is good. Yeah, for sure. I know at least for me, um, I tend to get a bit stuck on ideas yeah. a lot, a lot of times. Um, at least for me, what what really helps is always like at the very least having some place to talk about it, even if it's just very briefly during these meetings, or um, you know, reprioritizing things. It's like because this is a great idea, and I I came up with it maybe like a year ago or two years ago, and then I'm get, getting back to it right now. It's not you know, it's not so much of a hindrance. I've just been busy with other things, yeah. so. Yeah, and you know, I'm not like a grad student in philosophy, so like I'm not dependent on publishing something like this. Uh, but anyways, um, yeah, the ethical considerations of closed loop uh, AI assisted neuro st neuro stimulation techniques. Even what I've written there is just scratching the surface of what you can talk about and discuss with that. You can go very deep in terms of how much control we can have over other people and what sort of what sort of role that would be with respect to artificial intelligence itself, especially when it comes to neuro stimulation. So. Yeah, going beyond the simple closed loop of neurofeedback, with the neurofeedback coordinators administering the response as you uh, self-regulate your brain activity, with AI's assisted closed loop neurostimulation tactics, uh, te techniques, that raises a whole new suite of issues and questions that, to be quite frank, haven't been discussed so thoroughly by physicians, researchers, engineers, and um, we've almost taken it a bit for granted of letting AI do that for us. So, yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I definitely think like a lot of clinicians will kind of just use tools and say this is the tool and then not think about like what, the, you know, what the tool is, is like. So the, that's left to the engineers. Um, you know, from a medical perspective, there are always the four principles of bioethics. If you're not familiar with the four principles of bioethics, autonomy, uh, beneficence, non-maleficence, and uh, justice. And I guess in many ways, it is mostly nowadays simplified down to autonomy and more so a mindfulness of uh, consequences. So, you know, like, uh, yeah, yeah. 
Thanks. Yeah, no problem. All right, so let's move on to some other things. Uh, let's see. Uh, when I get to this thing, this is a feature. I hope this works out well. Um, so I've kind of got a collection of things here. It's kind of, you know, just bear with me on this. It'll be really interesting by the time we get to the end. Uh, this first thing was a... Okay. Um, so this first thing was a post by Wallace Marshall, who's a developmental biologist at UCSF. And he talked about this thing that he designed back in like 1989. So in 1989, there was this contest by Motorola sponsored it. And um, so this is where they kind of talk, they wanted people to design neural network based control systems that would take the place of a PID controller and maybe other types of industrial controllers. So there's has been this history of kind of using the brain as inspiration for sort of control because we know kind of intuitively that that's what the brain does in our own bodies. And so, you know, going back to Pitts and McCullough, you know, there's been this idea of using biophysical models of the, of the brain, especially neurons and synapses uh, to model some of these things. And so this was his attempt at modeling this. So this is figure one, this is a neuron. It's like the synapse is here, dendrites with this, downstream cell, and then there's synapses and dendrites of the next downstream cell, and you have axons coming in from other neurons, and they're, that's, you know, this is the model that he's using. So this is very biophysical, as you would expect from someone interested in biology. And then you have this model here where you have a weight matrix vector product update. So this is kind of like a memory map. And so this is a kind of an interesting approach. I assume he was uh, pretty young in 1989. So this is, you know, we always, you know, try to take our best shot at doing these models. So this is his shot of the model. And um, this is, of course, the model blown up. It's on graph paper, which I appreciate because I remember when we used to do everything on graph paper. Um, you can see, like, the bleed through from other mock-ups here. In the back in the background I don't know if you can see it but the point being is that you know you can build these seat of the pants models you can build these alternate models and I find them really fascinating because uh, machine learning say and neural network development has taken a certain path and we keep trying to optimize that path but maybe there are other paths that are maybe fruitful as well we just need to go and explore those for a while and of course we've talked about um, sort of like bio inspired models and how those can be very different from a neural network. Uh, but this, this actually goes all the way back to Alan Turing. And so Alan Turing proposed something called an unorganized machine. It's something that's one of his lesser known works. And we talked about unorganized machines a very long time ago in this group. I think it was like in 2019 or 2020. So this was like, I don't know if Jesse remembers me talking about this at one time. But um, this is something that oh. is... Um, let me see if he, vaguely, yeah, okay, well, now this is going to be less vague. Um, so this is uh, Turing's unorganized machine. So uh, he came up with this in a 1948 report. And Alan Turing, of course, worked on uh, a lot of computer science topics. He worked on the Turing machine, which was a model of computation. He also did things on reaction diffusion morphogenesis. So he developed the first reaction, or one of the original reaction diffusion models that explains pattern formation and morphogenesis. He also did a developmental model, which we've talked about also in the meetings here, or maybe in DevaWorm as well. And then he did this unorganized machine. And so this was where Alan Turing suggested that the infant human cortex was what he called an unorganized machine. And so the idea being that the human cortex in infants is not sculpted by the environment, that it's this sort of unorganized mechanism that is organized or trained over the course of learning, over the course of development, whatever. And that to an extent is true. You get these, uh, you know, when, when a newborn is born, it, there's actually this, uh, say, visual cortex that's there. And the visual cortex is maybe what you might consider to be overconnected. 
that is, is that the cells are there, the connections are there, and what happens in the early uh, the early years of visual experience is that that network is pruned down from like maybe a fully connected or near fully connected network to something that is patterned that can actually do like the processing that needs to be done in visual learning. If you don't have the appropriate visual learning, you know, there are other mechanisms that, uh, you know, lead you down a different path and you, your vision suffers as a result. So this is something that his, I think his argument here was that uh, development organizes the cortex. And so Turing defined the class of unorganized machines as largely random in their initial construction, but capable of being trained to perform particular tasks. Turing's unorganized machines were, in fact, very early examples of randomly connected binary neural networks. So this was actually before connect, much well before connectionism came along, and about the same time as the Pitts and McCullough work. So this is interesting in light of, like, we talked about the history of cybernetics, and this was around the same time as cyberneticists were coming up with this stuff. And I think Alan Turing was kind of a peripheral member of the Ratio Club which was, of course, the group of people who were doing cybernetic stuff. So this is not disconnected from cybernetics. Uh, and Turing claimed that these were the simplest possible models of the nervous system. Now, Turing had been interested in the possibility of simulating neural systems for at least the previous two years. In correspondence with William Ashby in 1946, and of course, W.R. Ashby is a main figure in cybernetics, he writes, I am more interested in the possibility of producing models of the action of the brain than in the application of practical computing. Although the brain may, in fact, operate changing its neural circuits by the growth of axons and dendrites, we could nevertheless make a model within the ACE, which is possibility was allowed for, but in which the actual construction of the ACE did not alter. So the ACE is this um, uh, model. Uh, so we make a model within the ACE in which this possibility was allowed for, but in which the actual construction of the ACE did not alter, but only the remembered data. So this is actually, there was a point in our Cognition Futures meeting where we talked about these, uh, Maturana talked about these networks and how they're uh, invariant in some ways and how, you know, they interact with the environment and they're these, what Maturana calls relations which don't change the network structure, but change how the network behaves. And so this is something that, um, it, it's an interesting historical point. So in his 1948 paper, Turing defined two examples of his own organized machines. The first were A-type machines. So A-type machines were essentially randomly connected networks of NAND logic gates. And so there are these A-type machines. Okay, let me go over the distinction between A-type machines and B-type machines in unorganized machines. So say we start with this network of A-type machines. And as we talked about in the session here, this is analogous to some sort of unorganized cortex, or at least in the way that Turing thought about it. And so this A-type machine has parts that are randomly connected. So you have nodes that are connect, fully connected. And of course, we know from complex systems theory that you can have cliques that are very highly connected like this. And you have uh, neural networks that are fully connected like this. And usually the goal is to prune these networks so that they have limited connectivity or these connections are weighted somehow. And so if we have a bunch of A-type machines in an array like this, we can have an artificial brain that does some sort of processing. Uh, if you have a bunch of A-type machines, there's not much processing that gets done because it's wholly unorganized. It's intact, but it's unorganized. And so the idea is that we replace these A-type machines with B-type machines. So a B-type machine is something that has a modifier in it. So, you know, one approach to developmental uh, machine learning is to take these A-type machines and prune the connections between the nodes in the A-type machines, yielding something that's a mature phenotype. Right? We could do that, and we could refine our processing. Another way forward, though, is to have these B-type machines, 
and replace modules that contain A-type machines with B-type machines. And now why would we want to do that? So these A-type machines, each of these modules are fully connected. If we replace them with B-type machines at different intervals, we actually replicate uh, something called the canalization function. And so in one of our recent preprints, we, we've talked about working with canalization functions. And canalization functions basically take development as a series of steps where things get implemented at certain points in development. So if we could think of this timeline as development, we can turn things on at certain points in development. So we can turn on trait A, trait B, and trait C, and then we can change the timing of when these things are implemented to enable different phenotypes in different types of learning. So what's important here is that the A-type machines can be serially replaced with B-type machines. And each of these points in the canalization function can point to when a module transitions from an A-type machine to a B-type machine. So now to review what a B-type machine is, it isn't just simply that these connections are pruned, it's that these connections are replaced with modifiers. So there's this neurosymbolic aspect. So instead of having, say, like a raw connection here and maybe just weighting it by like 0.6, we might have a semantic modifier, which might be like a logic function or some sort of semantic function involving language learning or involving some sort of embodiment. So these A-type machines are fully connected. We replace them serially with B-type machines. And we could have a mature phenotype that included some A-type machines and a mix of A-type and B-type machines. But we could also have a mature phenotype of fully B-type machines, and that would change the function of the network quite substantially. Basically, he's doing a very early sort of genetic search in, in a genetic algorithm space. This is the basis of unorganized machines. This, I think, is a picture of an unorganized machine with respect to neurons. If you look at a network in visual cortex, uh, you'll see that it's very similar to the unorganized machine model. And so the idea is that when, when infants are born, this neural network is random, randomly connected. There's no structure. And over time, these unorganized machines gain structure through interactions. So it's interesting stuff. This is an A-type machine. So this is an unorganized machine where it's just kind of random. And you can see these logic gates, which are the basis of the connections and how information is transmitted through the network. So this is a very interesting model. It's not what we consider to be like a neural net, modern neural network. So, you know, naturally it's, it's computationally sort of primitive because people haven't worked on this since Turing talked about it. But this is a, you know, like a good conceptual model. And I think it's, it's interesting in light of a lot of the things that have happened in the direction of like bio-inspired models and other things. So um, I did want to talk about PID controllers a little bit before I get into some other things that are going to be um, that kind of you know, the outcomes of this in the literature. So the PID controller is, this is the Wikipedia page here. Uh, a PID controller is a proportional integral derivative controller. And so if we think about say the regulator in cybernetics, PID controllers are kind of like the, the sort of the next step of that. And so this is one way in which people kind of operationalized uh, the regulator in the Everton regulator, for example. So, you know, how do you regulate a system? How do you regulate feedback? And this is, of course, a way that they do this in control theory, which kind of was born out of cybernetics. And so a PID controller or three-term controller, so there's a controller for proportional, there's a controller for integral, there's a controller for derivative at least terms for them in the controller. This is a control loop mechanism employing feedback that is widely used in industrial control systems and a variety of other applications requiring continuously modulated control. 
So this is where you need to be able to control the system under different conditions. A PID controller continuously calculates an error value and the difference between a desired set point and a measured process variable and applies a correction based on proportional, integral, and derivative terms denoted P, I, and D respectively, hence the name. So this is what we were trying to build an alternative to in the first example. So this is Wallace Marshall's model where you're building a, an alternative to this PID model. And so, you know, but this also has its roots in cybernetics as well because the good, the good regulation is very vague. And so the proposal in the PID model is that you have these three terms that take a, a feedback and re, you know sort of regu regularize it with respect to the system. So it's going through this, it's evaluating it in three different ways. So it's taking uh, proportions, it's taking, it's taking an integral, and it's taking a derivative. So it's basically doing some calculus on the system. And so this is uh, you know one way to do this. So in this model, we can look more closely at some of these different terms. So term P is proportional to the current value of the error term. For example, if the error is large, the control output would be proportionally large by using the gain factor K sub P. Using proportional control alone will result in an error between the set point and the process value because the controller requires an error to generate the proportional output response. In steady state process conditions, an equilibrium is reached with a steady SPPD offset. Okay, so that's for term P. Term I accounts for past values of the SPPV error and integrates them over time to produce the I term. For example, if there's a residual SPPV error after the application of proportional control, so after you've applied P, you apply I. And so if there's a residual error after P, then you take the integral uh, component and you apply that. The integral term seeks to eliminate the residual error acting at control effect due to the historical cumulative value of the error. So this is again like you know some of the things that we do in the model um, you know to sort of minimize that error. Uh, now you might say well what about prediction does this lead to prediction and the idea is that it should lead to prediction if you have data that is normally distributed or independently identically distributed. So this is something that is uh, workable if your system has some pattern that needs to be followed and you try to minimize the error to follow it. So it's very much in line with modern machine learning in that it's minimizing error and it's finding the least error or the least sort of error, minimizing the error term down to its global minimum. Uh, it, when the error is eliminated, the integral term will cease to grow. This will result in the proportional effect diminishing as the error decreases but this is compensated for by the growing integral effect. Then term D, which is um, a derivative, is the best estimate of the future trend of the SPPV error based on its current rate of change. It is some called, sometimes called anticipatory control. This is what we we're talking about with uh, anticipatory systems and Robert Rosen in, uh, in the Cognition Futures group. Amanda had brought up this book that we've talked about in Diva Worm. It's called uh, anticipatory systems. And one of the things about systems is that they have this aspect of anticipation. And so in the PID controller, they talk about term D being a best estimate of the future trend of this error. So it ex extrapolates things out into the future and it figures out what the, uh, so what the derivative is in time. And so it is effectively seeking to reduce the effect of SP minus PV error by exerting a control influence generated by the error, rate of error change. The more rapid the change, the greater the controlling or damping effect. So you have this sort of, uh, not only this negative feedback, um, but you also have this sort of um, feedback that dampens the effect, you know, so you don't get runaway feedback processes. That's the whole idea is you don't want runaway positive feedback, but you also, you know, Sometimes you don't want dampening as well, and so this is something that you can also account for. And so, um, so the balance of these effects is achieved by, achieved by loop tuning to produce the optimal control function. And so the tuning constants of 
uh, is shown below as k, and this equation down here must be derived for each control application, and they depend on the response characteristics of the complete loop external to the controller. So this is the mathematical form here, and it's just uh, you know an, a first-order integral that kind of describes the control regime. And so people use this in control theory quite a bit. And so this links into some of these alternative um, approaches to neural networks, but it also links back to the regular loop. Uh, NerveNet in Tinafors. This is a new look at the architecture and dynamics of the Hydra NerveNet. So if we look back at our uh, unorganized machines, we can see that we can represent neural networks in different ways. This is a biological system that is not uh, like the type of brain that we model uh, neural networks after. This is a nerve net where there's, uh, so this is a paradigm and you find this in uh, brain invertebrates like the hydra or the octopus. The hydra nervous system is the paradigm of a simple nerve net. Nerve cells in hydra, as in many cnidarian polyps, were organized in a nerve net extending throughout the body column. This nerve net is required for control of spontaneous behavior. Elimination of nerve cells leads to polyps that do not move and are incapable of capturing and ingesting prey. We have re-examined the structure of the hydra nerve net by immunostating polyps with the novel antibody that stains all nerve cells. We can use confocal imaging to show that there are two distinct nerve nets, one in the ectoderm, which is a layer of tissue, and one in the endoderm, which is another layer of tissue. Um, and so we have, you know, these are developmental layers that become different tissues. Um, and so they have different types of nerve net depending on where it is in the body. These are sort of, uh, sort of analogous to like a brain and a muscle type uh, system. So this is interesting, you know, where you have this kind of differentiation, but it's very different from the kind of thing that we see in, say, vertebrates. With the unexpected absence of nerve cells in the endoderm of the tentacles, the nerve nets in the ectoderm and endoderm do not contact each other. So there's this uh, barrier between the two types of nerve net. High-resolution uh, microscopy and serial block face uh, microscopy, scanning electron microscopy show that nerve nets consist of bundles of parallel overlapping neurites. So these are bundles of uh, overlapping neurites, and this is how they're organized. Results from the transgenic line show that neurite bundles include different neural circuits, and hence that neurites and bundles require circuit-specific recognition. Nerve cell-specific annexins indicate that gap junctions provide the specificity, and the occurrence of bundles supports a model for continuous growth and differentiation of the nerve net by a lateral addition of new nerve cells to the existing net. So this is where we have this model of growth in nerve nets. And so this is, let's see if we have any images here of nerve nets. So this is an image here where we have a, a hydra that's stained with antibodies and it shows where these nets, and so these nerve nets are called nets because they are continuous throughout the body of the hydra. So you have two different types of networks, but you can see that they're throughout the body of the net, of the Hydra. And so they operate in a very decentralized manner. And this is why they're interesting. Um, this is an example here of uh, sort of a cross section of the Hydra. So if you cut it like this and you look at the cross section, you can see um, some of how this is organized. Uh, let's see, C and D are sort of these parallel tracks of neurites. So you have these projections going through this, this cross section. And you can see how it's organized that way. Um, it's like that picture I showed you of like the, uh, I guess it was like a, a visual cortex and then the model that Turing made. So you can make a model of the nerve net. I haven't found any papers in people building uh, these sort of unorganized or organized models of nerve net, but that would be an interesting project to work on just to see what would happen. Uh, this is showing like the uh, ectoderm and endoderm. So you have Red arrow is showing sensory nerve cells in the ectoderm, and then yellow shows sensory nerve cells in the endoderm. So you can see that they're organized a bit differently. It's kind of hard to see here, but uh, uh, D is ectoderm surrounding the mouth, 
opening uh, viewed from above showing sensory nerve cells in, ec in ectoderm. Uh, so that's D. And then uh, E is ectodermal nerves that in a short section of tentacle tissue. So this is the mouth, this is the tentacle, and D and E respectively. And then uh, in trying to look for an endodermic uh, example, I don't think there is one. These are all ectodermic. So uh, yeah, C is in the ectoderm and in the endoderm. So actually C is a good example of how the nets differ. You can see uh, the ectoderm on the edge here and then the endoderm on the inside. And then uh, F is ectoderm nerve net in the peduncle and basal disc. And this just shows again, here's F here at the um, at this end here. And this just, this, this figure A kind of shows their location as slices through the hydra. So it's sort of at the um, uh, posterior end. So that's in hydra and nerve nets. This uh, perceptron from scratch is actually something talking about perceptrons and how you can build them using um, uh, Python and PyTorch. So perceptrons are an interesting model which involves using a very simple neural network. It's like a one-to-many mapping. And people use it, have used it in, like people used it in cognitive science very early on in the 70s to describe this relationship between you know, neurons and how they can classify things. And so this is a model you can build just for demonstration, for show. It's actually pretty good for uh, pattern recognition and for classification. Uh, I won't get into that because I don't have, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but we might talk about that later. This is another paper, though, that talks about perceptrons in plants. And you might think, what does a perceptron have to do with plants? And the answer is, is that it connects environment to development. So this paper is by Ben Shears and uh, Wynn van der Putten. This is, I think, in Nature. Yeah, it's in Nature. So it's from 2017. So this is uh, a paper that has built a perceptron in plants, and it connects environment to development. So the, uh, this is a review article. The abstract reads, plants cope with the environment in a variety of ways. An ecological analysis attempts to capture this through life history strategies or trait-based categorization. So this is where they're kind of like plants are very uh, famous models for looking at environmental change. So if you change the environment, plant growth can be impacted. Um, you can do different things with auxins, which are the growth hormones, and you can do very, you know, plants are very responsive to light and other types of stimuli, temperature, things like that. So you can stress plants and they can uh, adapt in, in the ways that they have. And, you know, we can do this through ecological analysis. We can look at like how they behave throughout their lives and through their development and through their maturity, or you can characterize traits that adapt with environmental change. These approaches are limited, however, because they treat the trade-off mechanisms that underlie plant responses as a black box. So we go back to the black box idea where we uh, can actually model things on a black box, but the problem is we don't understand very much because we kind of like observe something and then we model it. We say, well, this process is a black box. We don't need to understand it to show the effect. So this is what they're trying to, to open up. They're trying to illuminate this black box with a perceptron. Approaches that evolve, involve the molecular physiological analysis of plant responses of the environment have elucidated intricate connections between developmental and environmental signals but in only a few well-studied model species. So plants don't have a brain. They may have something that approximates a nervous system, maybe not even as sophisticated as a nerve net, but there's information processing in the plant. And this is what they're interested in. It's information processing that leads to these adaptations. So, you know, we can build a model that isn't a black box, that has this sort of connectivity and, and information processing quality, we can use a perceptron as sort of a stand-in for that to sort of model that process. And if it's perceptron-like, then we're in, in, in line. So by considering diversity in the plant response to the environment is the adaptation of an information processing network. New directions can be found for the study of life history strategies, trade-offs, and evolution in plants. So they're interested here in plant biology and plant evolution, 
but they're interest, also interested in this information processing by perceptrons. So they have a perceptron here, which is a very simple sort of model of a neural network. This is something that was developed in the 70s to show some of these principles, and then later they became part of the connectionist paradigm. But a, a perceptron is basically uh, modeled in the following way. So you have a series of inputs, and you have a series of weights. And so the inputs are these nodes at the top. The weights are these uh, combinations that can go to an output. And the weights are just basically how much contributes to any one output. So you can do this either with inputs and outputs, or inputs, a hidden layer, and outputs. And so you basically have your inputs, you bring them in, you weight the contributions of those inputs to a single output, you have a function that decides what the output should look like, and then you get this uh, kernel that shows the output in terms of classification. So whether it's a zero or a one, and there's a step function that determines whether an input is a zero or a one, and it actively is able to classify it. So it's a very simple classifier. It's a very simple system, but it demonstrates kind of the power of neural networks at a very fundamental level. So you can use this to look at plant sort of, I don't want to say cognition, but plant information processing. And so we can use these input processing units to look at this. So, you know, they, they give an explanation of what perceptrons are in this section here. You get a multi-layer perceptrons where you have these hidden layers, which allow you to process things further from the input and kind of add together features so you can have this nonlinear effect in the weight. So this is where you have this nonlinear effect here where you can classify it uh, in different according to different criteria. Uh, analogous to perceptrons, protein molecules and gene promoters can form processing units. So what they're interested in with plants are proteins and gene promoters, which of course lead to gene expression. So they're interested in environmental factors uh, affecting the plant in a way that triggers gene expression, triggers different protein modifications and things like that. So, you know, we have proteins or, or, or uh, gene promoters that are these processing units or these circles, and these weights then are formed by biochemical connections and their relative importance to that relationship, so that interaction. Together, these yield an information processing network that selects appropriate outputs for combinations of inputs. Plant molecular responses to environmental challenges perform similarly to multi-layer perceptrons and information processing in the sense that several perception units operate in parallel and are weighted appropriately at subsequent levels to define an output transcriptome. So what they're trying to do is trying to give, you know, trying to find a transcriptional response that's appropriate to what the, the environment that the plant is facing and how the plant adapts to it. Or rather, the environment that it's facing and the transcriptome that the plant responds with. So there are going to be changes to the transcriptome as the plant encounters different environmental stressors. So if you provide too much light or not enough light to the plant, it has a transcriptional response that serves as the output to this perceptron. Hey Bradley. Yeah. What might be uh, limiting or inhibiting us from referring to this as cognition versus, say, information processing? Uh, the, the idea of plant cognition yeah. versus, say, in, you know, purely information processing, which would be like, you know, uh, plants respond to an environment, to what extent might that be constituting, or you might be able to describe that as cognition, so. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, like, uh, with respect to some of the stuff Mike Levin has done, in fact, the TAME framework, we know that, like, he thinks of cognition as these competencies. So, in Mike Levin's world, you know, that plant, what plants do is cognition, and in fact, what any cell does is cognition, and he sort of there's this idea of cellular decision making, which is an analogy, but Levin's model basically puts that into a framework of just kind of steps to, like, say, human cognition or some complex cognition. These networks can maybe operate in the same way. You have these very simple networks that operate on a simple principle, and then you build these networks up from perceptrons to neural networks to brain networks, and, you know, or things that are undefined or un refined to something that's more refined. And those, those 
cognitive capacities or competencies kind of fall into place. Uh, that's one view. And then the other view is that, you know, when we say cognition and we make the connection between cognition and information processing, it really is an analogy. And it, it's just, you just want to be careful in applying cognition because cognition has a lot of baggage with, that comes with it. So when you say something is cognitive. Yeah, um, absolutely, or, absolutely. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that's, that's, I mean, that's the basic distinction. Um, but I'm going to finish up with this section and then we'll kind of finish up this this topic. So the one of the things I wanted to talk about here was that, um, you know, so we think about this sort of uh, information processing system maybe as cognition. Uh, there's this response to environmental challenges. There's this, uh, you know, we uh, several perceptron units can operate in parallel and are weighted appropriately at subsequent levels. Uh, this enables a selection of alternate outputs on the basis of information from many different inputs. So you have sort of this decision-making quality. In this view, the logic of an individual plant's life history strategy is encoded in the connections and weights of this information processing network, which translates combinations of environmental inputs into appropriate responses. And so they talk about this in this review. Uh, they talk about how environmental inputs modulate nodes in a developmental network. So they talk about development much as Turing did and how you know that developmental network is shaped oh. by experience to an adult form. Uh, but then, you know, there are other things going on with biological networks versus perceptrons. Biological networks are connected in more intricate ways, and the inputs are not processed synchronously. Uh, we also have to consider that intermediate layers are modified by environmental and developmental signals that operate over different time scales. So these hidden layers, or these intermediate layers, are, you know, very well specified in biology. There they can be. And in the perceptron, we kind of have to make a guess as to what the specifications are. So like, you know, in, in, in development, we have this time scale. Environment gives another time scale. Evolution gives yet another time scale, but they're specified with respect to function oftentimes. Um, so environmental inputs operate on the order of seconds to minutes, whereas developmental responses and feedbacks operate mostly on the order of hours to days. So we have these different aspects of, of adaptation that are important. Uh, third, lower nodes provide feedback to upper nodes. So in biology, we have feedback here, or what in neural networks we call recurrent connections. But in the perceptron, we don't have recurrent connections. It's just kind of like this simple categorization. But it's interesting to think, if we go back to uh, Wallace Marshall's model or uh, Alan Turing's model, that they're thinking about feedback as well. They're thinking about how that can be handled. And of course, re recurrent connections, is only that's only one way to do it. That was proposed as sort of a workaround almost to uh, neural networks back in the late 80s, early 90s. So recurrent networks are a form of neural network, and those have been kind of incorporated into machine learning. But there are other ways to do feedback, and in fact, more explicit ways to do feedback which, you know, with a perceptron, you could have feedback as well, but it's um, something that, you know, again, it's again, it's just kind of reimagining uh, neural networks and, and other types of computational representations. So uh, the biological networks encode feedback properties, which indicates that such networks may be more accurate analogies for biological information processing. So these are He's talking specifically about recurrent neural networks encoding feedback properties, but biological networks also encode feedback properties, uh, and, and because this is important for their function, but recurrent neural networks aren't the only game in town. There may be better ways to do this. Lastly, machine learning algorithms learn by adjusting their output to the input. So you have to have the output has to know what the input's doing. It can adjust these weights, so the weights are adaptive over time. So this is where feedback comes in is critical because it really does manage these weights and what the output looks like. So the output is shaping the input. And, you know, there are ways to do this in, in parallel systems like we have with the brain or with nerve nets or any of these other models. Although feedback exists, there is no evidence to show that the molecular networks involved in the plant response to the environment learns 
by other mechanisms apart from the random adjustment of weights, the mutation and selection that shapes the revolution. So the second part to Hussein's question is that we can't say that um, you know plants are sort of modifying their own feedback other than in the very simple biological sense of adaptation. Like yeah, data, yeah. yeah. It's interesting from an academic research and theoretical context, but even say with um, personal decisions, say your diet, choosing to be um, eating at all foods you want, and it's like, why do people draw the line with, say, being vegetarian? It's okay to eat vegetables, and perhaps perchance, if there were for more there are arguments, then the cognition of a plant is the same way, then those sorts of personal questions on an, on a day-to-day -day level, you know, it is, those are taken to accounts about why exactly a plant is not an animal so yeah. yeah well i mean yeah there is this actually this interesting aspect of reinforcement learning too which is that reinforcement learning is based on sort of like decision making in, in animals so it's it's definitely brain oriented but we can use reinforcement learning quite effectively and the question is is how do we apply that i mean we have non-cognitive systems we can apply it to so interesting. yeah yeah, for sure. yeah. yeah. All right, so I think that's it for today. Um, yeah. Well, just once again, that, that Wikipedia, what was it, unstructured networks? Yeah, so let's see if I can go back to this. Uh, this is, yeah, um, unorganized machines. So unorganized machines. Okay. The Wikipedia article. And, uh, uh, yeah. Um, I just wasn't sure how... Um, how similar that was to uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, okay. like uh, uh, the, the utility of random matrix theory in you know machine learning. <clears throat> oh yeah, I don't know how they're connected, but maybe yeah. they are. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So there are a couple of uh, technical papers on the bottom. This 1948 yeah. paper has been reprinted as Turing's Intelligent Machinery. In the collected works of Turing, uh, and then this unorganized machine and artificial neural networks article by Webster and Evolutionary Intelligence, and that's for tw in 2012. So mm -hmm. there are uh, mm -hmm. some some follow ups to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the dogs just want to express their joy for unorganized machines. Yeah. <laughs> Always have to be careful being so mechanistic and reductionist, even with plants. Yeah, and then yeah, please share a link of the Art Hydra neural network. Oh yeah, yeah, I can put that in the Slack so we can look at it. Um, yeah. So okay, well thank you for attending, um, and see you in Slack, and then see you next week. Take care. Take care.